Brumbach. I am vice chair of the Legislative Action Committee, which oversees the legislative activity of the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts. We work on bills in over 20 different areas, elections and voting, of course, but also climate change, education, housing, women's issues, and many more. For 101 years now, the League of Women Voters has been a nonpartisan, activist, grassroots organization for women and men whose core mission is empowering voters and defending democracy, a mission that seems even more critical right now. We encourage informed and active participation in government and work to increase understanding of major public policy issues and influence public policy through education and advocacy. This afternoon's meeting is co-sponsored by the Cape Women's Coalition and it is part of the Cape Cod League's ongoing effort to help citizens understand the legislative session that started in January and significant issues that are being considered by our legislators. The Cape Cod League has been focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. We have had three workshops on DEI and have worked with the Cape Cod chapter of the NAACP, the Nauset Interfaith Association, no Place for Hate, Amplify, and the Barnesville County Human Rights Advisory Commission. We have invited these organizations and their members to attend this meeting via Zoom. The format today was sent to the legislators ahead of time. Each will have two minutes to comment on the most important issues during this legislative session. The second part of the event will be a brief open discussions on the topics of affordable housing and voting legislation. And we will end with a closing statement from each legislator. We received word this morning that Senator Julian Sear is not well and unable to be here today. We thank him and his staff for helping us set up this whole event. We also received word that Representative David Vieira is not going to be able to be with us. He is a third Barnesville representative. So we will begin with the two minute opening remarks. I will call on the representatives in the Barnesville district order. You will see a timekeeping clock in gallery view. So our first speaker will be representative Timothy Whalen from the first Barnesville district, who has been representing this district since 2015. So for a two minute statement, representative Whalen. Thank you, Nancy, uh, very much. And thank you uh, as well to uh, the League of Women Voters, uh, the Cape Women's Coalition, and to the Cape Media Center for your efforts in putting together this uh, wonderful forum. It's always great to uh, have the opportunity to speak uh, and be seen uh, and, and have our thoughts communicated with the public that we serve and we serve very well. Um, I have to open by wishing everybody a happy spring. We're finally here into better weather, yay. Uh, and I also want to uh, thank the the time and the investment in um, sweat equity that I share um, with my hardworking colleagues and dear friends in the Cape and Islands delegation. Uh, we are truly a bipartisan delegation working together always uh, for the best interests of us, the citizens that we serve. Uh, we leave politics at the door and we just work hard and work together and communicate well. I'm honored to be a part of this group. Um, going forward in this uh, legislative session, the 192nd legislative session. Um, one thing that's new in this session uh, is a new committee assignment that I received, which is very applicable for many people here in our community. Uh, I've been assigned as the ranking Republican on the Joint Committee on Elder Affairs. I'm looking forward to the work that we have going ahead, serving um, uh, our senior population, listening to our senior population, reviewing the legislation that's filed. I'm going to be serving on this um, committee with uh, uh, Senator Julian Sear, who is the uh, vice chair um, from the Senate side, who's going to be sitting on it as well. So you're going to have uh, some advocates uh, there as well. And I believe uh, is it Representative Xaros is on there as well. Um, so Cape Cod is well represented. Um, uh, our seniors are going to be heard. And I've already spoken with the House Chair, Rep. Tom Stanley, who's a dear friend of mine from Waltham. Uh, and he has a house on Cape Cod. And I'm going to start uh, um, edging him down here a little bit more to make sure he can meet with our local COA directors and that he can hear directly from our uh, senior population. Uh, I'm gonna continue my work as well, particularly in, uh, in this pandemic, 
uh, working hard to support our, our hardworking uh, police officers, our firefighters, uh, EMTs, paramedics, healthcare professionals, school teachers, people, uh, uh, our, our people who are, are essential workers, uh, people who are serving on the front lines amidst uh, this uh, COVID pandemic and without whom we couldn't uh, uh, go forward. So thank you very much. And uh, my time is up. I will pass it on. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have uh, Representative Kip Diggs from the second Barnesville district who was recently elected and is serving his first term in the house. Representative Diggs. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, excuse me. Uh, it's, been, it's been a busy morning, so busy day. So I've been kind of running around going from Zoom to Zoom. It's been kind of, kind of cool and I, and I like it. And, and being a first time rep, um, working with my colleagues, it's, it's, it's been really uh, awesome to work with a group that really cares and loves uh, their communities like I do. Um, my name is Kip Diggs. I'm the second uh, Bonstable District Representative. And, and how I got really started in this was um, four years ago, my son was killed in a car accident and, and four other boys. And uh, I, got to, I got fed for three months and I didn't have to, you know, the, the, the district really just took care of me. So um, when this pandemic started to happen, I was like, what can I give back? And I, I felt this was a way for me to hustle, work hard for, for those and not leave one rock unturned. And that's basically my work is what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here with the League of Women Voters. Um, my committees that I'm working with um, this year is uh, education, housing, health and uh, healthcare and finance, tourism, in uh, when culture in, in uh, redistricting, so I've got a very busy schedule, but hard work is not a is not a problem for me. I'm a former World Walterway champion, and I I look forward to doing whatever I have to do to to help our community and help our our youth grow. And and, and all these issues that we're having, um, we they can be solved with a lot of love and a lot of hard work, and that's what we're going to do. So thanks for having me, and I, I look forward to talking with you more. Thank you very much. Then our next, next speaker is Representative Sarah Peake of the 4th bon Barnesville District, who was first elected in 2007 and is serving her eighth term in the House. Thank you for that long service, Representative. Nancy, thank you for having us on today. And you know, where did those years go? Although I'm looking at myself on this Zoom call and I say, oh, I can see where those years went. They went to these wrinkles and this gray hair, but... Uh, they also went to a lot of good and hard work. And uh, so I represent the fourth Barnstable district. I have the honor and privilege of sharing uh, the town of Brewster with representative Whalen. Uh, the rest of the district encompasses all of Harwich, Chatham, Orleans, East Ham, Wellfleet, Truro and Provincetown. And not to make my colleagues jealous, but quite honestly, I think it's the best part of Cape Cod. Although I do, I do love and respect where, where they represent as well. So as you mentioned, um, I'm in my eighth term and I will tell you, uh, I have never had a year in public service like this last year, starting March 14th, March 13th uh, of 2020, when I hastily packed up papers and some files and a couple of thumb drives and left my office at the state house and didn't return there for maybe nine months. And when I did return, it was with a double mask on and just coming in to be a vote monitor. We learned how to vote remotely. We learned how to conduct hearings remotely. We passed legislation to allow boards of selectmen and other local boards to meet remotely. We passed legislation to allow mail-in voting and early voting to ensure that the functions of government at all levels could continue uh, to take place and to happen. In addition to that, paying attention and taking care of the health and well being of everybody here on Cape Cod. And the silver lining in all of this is we've learned a lot, but for me, the silver lining is these people you see on the screen, working with them each and every day, side by side, as Representative Whalen talked about. Uh, Team Cape Cod is strong. I need to give a shout out to Representative Hunts, Hunt and Crocker, who served so admirably, as well as welcoming our new members, Representative Ixaros and Representative uh, Diggs. Uh, we're a small, but we're a mighty band. Thank you, Representative Peake. Next, we have Representative Stephen Ixaros, 
from the 5th Barnstable District. And as Representative Peek just mentioned, he was recently elected and is serving his first term in the House. Representative Ixaros. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I love this. So yes, I'm brand new, just like Kip Diggs. Imagine there were 17 new uh, representatives voted in by uh, the people of the Commonwealth, and two of them are right here. Two rookies side by side. I love being on Team Cape Cod, as Sarah said. Uh, but briefly, my story is I'm not a, a seasoned politician. I served 40 years as a police officer. I started as a summer police officer and uh, 40 years later, I left a job that I loved as the deputy chief of police in Yarmouth. During that time, you see a lot of good things and uh, sadly, a lot of sad things. But I take that energy and what we learned to this job. It's important, it's all about service. So I see it as another way to serve. I'm just a triple decker kid from New Bedford. I grew up in a triple decker in a very poor section of New Bedford, came to Cape Cod and never left. I love this. I live in West Barnstable. I uh, represent parts of Barnstable, Sandwich, Bourne and even Plymouth. We're here to serve you. And um, I'm very concerned with the opioid crisis. I'm concerned with a lot of issues that, that we all are. And just know you have someone that that really does care about people, that has a big heart. And like Kip Diggs, unfortunately, I, I'm a parent that lost a, a child as well. And I know what it was like to, to come back from that the best we could and how the community came together to support my family. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I ran for this position, to, to keep helping others and to do the right thing. And I'm honored to be here today with you. Thank you very much. And now we have Representative Dylan Fernandez, who represents the Barnstable, Dukes, and Nantucket District. He was elected in 2017 and is serving his third term. Representative Fernandez. Thanks, Nancy. And yes, um, I represent the most unique district uh, in the Commonwealth, uh, three counties nine towns, three island chains. Um, it's, it's quite different and has uh, pretty unique needs. So I'm Dylan Fernandez. I'm a fourth generation Falmouth resident. My, my family immigrated here from uh, the Azores and they were part of that big uh, strawberry farming community of Portuguese residents here on Cape Cod. Um, and you know, I got into this um, part of that family. My father grew up in really extreme poverty uh, in Falmouth. Um, college was never an option for him and his uh, eight brothers and sisters. Um, he didn't even graduate from high school, but in this really classic American dream story, um, worked hard, started a small business, worked to see it grow and witnessed the reward of his hard work when I graduated from college, um, an opportunity that, that he and his, his family never had. And so, um, you know, I come at this as a lot of my colleagues do, uh, with a, a strong desire to give back to the community that's given me and my family uh, so much. And when I look around Cape Cod, there, there are a lot of things and a lot of people uh, that need help. We have uh, a housing crisis that we're grappling with where young people and elderly people are having a really hard time uh, making a fo foothold here. We have a climate crisis that is gonna impact our district more than any other, maybe in the nation, right? Um, we have, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying our best to recover from COVID, uh, in representing a constituency that is one of the oldest demographics in the entire country. So there are a lot of unique challenges on Cape Cod and the islands. Um, and this, this team here with the CAPE delegation uh, is working really hard to tackle them. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Representative Fernandez. And now we have Senator Susan Moran of the Plymouth and Barnstable District. She was first elected to a special election in May of 2020, and then was reelected to the full term in November of 2020. So Senator Moran. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy, and, and to the league. This is, uh, terrific opportunity to not only talk about issues, to um, also really showcase, and, and it's been mentioned um, by Rep Peek and others, how 
well we work together as a delegation, how committed we are. My Senate partner who couldn't be here today, Senator Sear, um, like Rep Peak, um, who's Speaker Peak, um, is in leadership. And uh, when she talks about being mighty, um, we do have incredible inroads. And that has really helped us in working together to um, form and maintain the COVID consortium that is, has really put um, vulnerable folks, especially on the Cape and now moving toward younger folks and, and more towards opening um, economic development avenues in the forefront in terms of um, advocacy. I'm very proud of, of um, the communities that I represent on the Cape, which include Falmouth and Bourne and Sandwich, but my district also straddles and reaches toward the State House in uh, Plymouth and Kingston and Pembroke. So my team has a unique opportunity of, you know, straddling uh, the canal. We, we're looking, we, the delegation just finished um, in an information report about the Bourne and Sagamore bridge work um, that's coming up. Um, my focus has always been on economic development. My experience as a board of selectmen chair in Falmouth and my experience on the uh, assembly of delegates for the Cape has really steeped me in the issues and, and where the needs are and, and how to move forward. And one of the things that I'm working on heavily right now is a universal child care bill that's going to be that support for opening COVID and, and going forward. Um, I'm looking forward to talking about issues. I, um, I have a strong team that is focused on constituents. Please feel free to call me or email me with any concerns. I'm not seeing a clock, but I'm, I'm gonna just end it there. Okay, I'm seeing a clock. So I'm glad you, you decided to end it there. <laughs> okay, good. Perfect timing. Great. We now go into the, the second part of the program, which will be discussions of affordable housing and of voting issues. With so many problems facing our citizens, even before COVID-19, deciding which issues to discuss was a challenge. Since social justice is at the core of our advocacy, the League decided to focus on the affordable housing problem on the Cape and on voting legislation. Two legislators have volunteered to begin the discussions of these issues in, in each case. And then the other legislators present are welcome and encouraged to add their comments as we go along to add their comments to the discussion. We're gonna devote about 10 minutes to each topic, which is just scratching the surface of these issues, but you know, we have an hour, so we will do what we can. So affordable housing is a grave concern among the league members. What difficulty does building more affording, affordable housing on the Cape face? And what are we doing to increase affordable housing on the Cape? We're gonna start with Representative Fernandez and then Representative Whalen, and then have every, anyone else who wants to join in do so. So Representative Fernandez first on affordable housing. Sure, thanks Nancy. Um, look, it's, it's clear that we're at a crisis point with lack of affordability on Cape Cod, um, you know, it's it, young people are leaving the Cape and Islands in droves because they can't afford a first home here. Uh, working people um, put it as one of the number one issues that they face. And if you talk to small businesses as well, they'll chime in to say it is incredibly hard uh, to recruit and find a workforce because of the lack of housing. And, uh, and, and seniors are having a really time, a really hard time as well. Uh, finding housing or trying to downgrade um, on, on, uh, in our region. And so we are at a, a real tipping point on this issue on whether or not we, we can become a sustainable area for people to, to stay here uh, and live. The legislature has taken up a number of packages around this, um, significant funding uh, towards building new housing, uh, significant programs uh, towards helping people get into new housing, um, but more significant, a lot more needs to be done. Uh, a big part of this is around um, zoning reform, um, which the legislature passed last session to make it 
uh, easier for folks to um, zone districts in a way that encourage housing. Um, frankly, we just have limited space on the Cape and Islands and we want to preserve as much green space and as much of our natural environment as we can. So it makes a whole lot more sense um, if we're zoning for higher density in downtown areas that already have uh, a commercial hub so that we're not tearing down green space and so that we're promoting housing in areas that are next to transit, next to jobs, next to you know walk down the street, go to the supermarket uh, and the like. Um, we have a lot of opportunities there. You know, another component of this is also funding. Uh, the building cost for housing is, uh, has, <laughs> was already high. It got a lot higher during this pandemic um, as uh, the costs of goods have really risen, particularly in the building sector. So that's a challenge. And that's a really big challenge. It, it's and the cost of building, especially in my district on the islands where there's a lot of addition, additional costs associated with that are, are exorbitantly high. So we also need a funding mechanism for this. Uh, and one piece that I've put forward has been around uh, creating a transfer fee on luxury home sales, multi, multi-million dollar home sales so that a, a, a town can impose a, a half to a 2% little transfer fee, tiny percentage on the second million dollars of uh, cost of someone's home. So this would only go uh, be a tiny fee on multimillionaires buying multimillion dollar homes. A lot of times their second or third home, you know, we love our seasonal folks, but a lot of times they're pushing out uh, a lot of the locals and the, and, and the people who, who work here. Um, let, let so me, I think let let me let Rep. Whalen come in there and then- Sorry, I don't have a timer, to... so I'll just keep going, Nancy. Well, we'll, we'll get back to it. This, this is a discussion, <laughs> not, a, not a review, but I do want to uh, include him on the list as well. Right. Helen, I can't tell you how much I enjoy listening to you, though, so I, I, I could let you go on all day. <laughs> Thanks, Timmy. Your <laughs> first my friend is always, always the best, though. We'll see so uh, I'm going to sound like a complete homer here when I talk about um, how- happy I am with the work that's going on in the first Barnstable district, the towns within the first Barnstable district um, toward um, tackling what is absolutely a crisis in affordable housing. And I speak on this crisis being coming from the same boat as uh, Representative Xaros discussed. I'm a, I'm a veteran of a three-decker family in the city of Worcester. Uh, I have two daughters, both who live off Cape, one who owns a home in East Brookfield, um, because she can't afford a home down here. So my kids live off, uh, off Cape. I, I grew up just down the street from my grandparents and they were in my life every day. Um, kids nowadays uh, aren't gonna be seeing their grandparents if their grandparents live down here because it's impossible for younger folks to buy homes here. But to help answer that problem, look at, uh, for instance, the town of Brewster. The town of Brewster uh, is in the process of building uh, uh, rental housing development on Brewster Road. I have to give a ton of credit to our uh, municipal partners in, in all four of the towns, but here in Brewster, they got $1.6 million in state grants to help build it. And I'm trying to remember, it's something like 26 units. I, I, and you'll forgive me, I know that that's not a precise number of uh, affordable rental housing. And rental housing is huge. There's a big difference between um, you know, purchasing homes, uh, versus rentals. And I think rentals is where the need truly is. In the town of Dennis, through hard work um, and just perseverance, uh, the, the town worked with the Cape and Islands Veterans Outreach Center. And they just we just recently celebrated the ribbon cutting. Uh, I remember I was there with Rep Diggs for the ribbon cutting of the homeless veterans home. Uh, that was about a four year soap opera that the town of Dennis just, uh, God bless them, they, they just continued to fight through. Now we have five veterans in our community who, who have um, supportive housing to help them get back on their feet, as well as the work that uh, that we did, uh, Senator Sierra and I did with Project Forward to get them $1 million and a CDAC grant so that they could build a, a house for eight adults on the autism spectrum. The town of Yarmouth, we got the town of Yarmouth $4 million in state grants and tax incentives so that they could build the Yarmouth Commons Project on Route 28 with 69 units of affordable housing. And what can I say about the town of Barnstable? The town of Barnstable kind of set the standard for everybody else here um, with their commitment to um, uh, building affordable housing. A lot of this is answered at the municipal level and where I think we have to find the balance, and this is to my friend, uh, Representative Fernandez's words, is trying to 
um, use those funds in such a way to build. It's, it all depends upon where you build, So, because we don't want to wipe out the green space here on the Cape. But I'm also going to put a challenge out here to our municipal partners to shift more monies from CPA funds, from open space preservation, and putting more into affordable housing. Sitting in front of me in the house uh, uh, is Representative Mike Connolly from Cambridge. Uh, Mike was telling me that I believe it's 80% of the CPA funds in Cambridge go toward building affordable housing. And in some of our towns here uh, throughout the Cape, we can do better. I'd like to see a shift in more of those funds, but in still doing that development in such a way that we maintain that balance so we're not wiping out the green space. We have to balance it better. Thank you. Let me let, me let I was gonna ask Representative Diggs, because I think you mentioned you were on the Joint Committee on Housing and, and what effect do you think that committee assignment will have? A huge, a huge effect. I mean, what's great is I'm on these committees that really affect not just my district, but our whole Cape. We're we are a peninsula, and we we need to be we need to take care of all of us, and we have to. And that's why you know I think everybody on this on the Cape delegation, all of our committees are regards to our area, and how we can affect our area and how we can help. So you know, having housing is so huge. I mean, I'm thinking of the single mothers. You know, I was a single. I was a I was a father, and I was having to raise my kids. Uh, while I was going to school, and, and let me tell you, thank God I had my grandparents and my and my aunts and uncles. I, I was I was fortunate, but nowadays not everyone is in that same predicament. So you know that, that's why we need the common start. You know, it's something that Sue Moran's really pushing that we need to have something so that these kids can, you know, there's a lot of the single mothers can go ha go ahead and get a job, but then know that their kids are safe and and, and, and are able to have a place to go to. So we housing is huge you know thank I mean? you so let me let, let me see if anyone else wants to chime in a little bit uh rep peak yeah, just in, just in the last minute you know uh, what tim identified in his communities is, is great however not every community despite giving lip service to affordable housing follows through and actually gets the housing built senator sear and i worked very hard to get state-owned land transferred basically for free from the state over to the town of truro that's being held up in uh, because of some litigious neighbors. It's being held up in court. You know, we're not taking down trees. This isn't virgin forest or, or anything like that. So it's important that when we go and we vote for members of the planning board and, or if they're appointed by the board of selectmen, that we pay attention to things locally because we can do a lot at the state level, but ultimately it comes down to what the local planning and zoning decisions are in order to spur affordable housing. And lastly, we talked about CPA funds. I'd like to throw one other funding source, local funding source out there. This delegation worked very hard to pass the uh, Airbnb, so-called Airbnb tax bill. So now all rentals, whether it's a traditional hotel or motel room or a condo or a house, uh, there is a local share that comes back to the community. Communities on Cape Cod saw, I'll use the term windfall of new revenue coming in, some over a million dollars of new revenue. I think at our town councils and at our town meetings, we need to earmark a certain percentage of that new money to go towards affordable housing before it gets spent on other things and it doesn't feel like new and additional revenue anymore. This is millions of dollars across the Cape that could be devoted to affordable housing, but that's a local decision that has to be made by the local boards of selectmen and at town meeting. Thank you. And, and the two people that didn't get in, we'll get you in the next two. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but we do need to go on to the other topic that we wanted to discuss was voting legislation. And there's a, a, a bill pending called the Votes Act, which the league helped to draft. And that will make permanent many of the election changes that were adopted to deal with the pandemic in last fall's election that were very popular. It will allow all vo voters to vote by mail. It will expand early voting. It will establish same day voter registration. It will ensure that eligible voters who are incarcerated have an opportunity to vote and it will create improved post-election audit system. At a time when voter suppression is making headlines across the country, and I'm sure you just saw the, the headlines on the Georgia bill this morning, we salute the Massachusetts legislature for taking up legislation to improve access to the ballot, not restrict it. So kudos to all of you for considering this. 
And I want to thank Senator Sir and Representatives Peek, Fernandez and Diggs for co-sponsoring this bill. So the questions for this, this 10 minutes session is what changes in the Votes Act do you think are most important? And what issues related to voting in Massachusetts concern you the most? And for this, I'm going to start with Representative, or Senator Moran and then Representative Peek and then Representative Exaros because he didn't get a chance to talk last time either. So Senator Moran first on voting. Uh, thank you so much. I wanted to speak on this issue because I'm in the unique position of having lived the pivot from starting an election. It was a special election before COVID or at the beginning and then having to switch toward of COVID time running for office. And, you know, there's nothing like being on the ground with so many, um, you know, league members, for example, trying to figure out, you know, how do, how do we still have our voices heard? when we, you know, we're worried about touching pens or we do, and candidates, we don't have, um, we can't really handshake. How, what is that whole change about? And well, you know, the Senate president has just started a committee that will look at the things during COVID that, you know, we're, we'll be glad to get rid of as soon as possible and the things that we should keep. So the Senate just extended um, uh, of mail-in voting COVID uh, legislation. And I, I just to sort of keep it, you know, keep the, the next local elections moving as, as quickly as we can. But when we look at voting rights and, and ballot access, and, and you mentioned what's going on across the country in Georgia, I, I think this is the time we have to be incredibly vigilant and, and look at you know, what the data shows. Um, in, in our case, for example, we had very high turnout. Um, in Plymouth, the turnout was um, almost 80%. It was um, almost 50% by mail, Barnstable. 81% turnout, 41% by mail, Falmouth. 83% turnout, 46% by mail, and Sandwich, 84 turnout, 41 by mail. Those, those are the numbers I happen to have right in front of me. But the mail system has proven to be the way to ensure that voting is most convenient and that we can really um, have more opportunities for folks who may be working, may be having child care issues, may have um, care issues that they they're responsible for during during the, the particular times when when we normally go out and vote. There, the reason that we've seen such positive civic engagement is because we have more opportunity. And it, in terms of sponsoring, I'm in. Thank you. I, I will quote uh, Michelle Tassinari in, Senate, in Secretary of State Galvin's office. She was asked about mail voting. She said, not gonna be no backseas on that one. So Representative Peek on voting. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Uh, you stole my thunder a little bit because I, I was going to say, and I guess now I'm going to say it anyway, uh, on the afternoon uh, after the Georgia governor signed into law uh, a, the most regressive voter suppression legislation that we have seen since uh, Jim Crow, uh, I think it's especially important that today we talk about uh, the Votes Act and the importance of access to the ballot and what we can do to encourage more people to be engaged, to encourage more people to participate in the process and make it easier for people to vote. Um, we've learned a lot of lessons as a result of COVID-19 and those lessons aren't just about washing your hands a lot and wearing a face mask and social distancing. Some of those lessons are the things that we had to improvise to ensure that the work of government continues such as remote meetings Participation in uh, local boards of selectmen meetings, by the way, is, is through the roof because people don't have to find a babysitter. They don't have to drive at night. They don't have to you know, get out in their cars and actually physically go to a meeting, but they can participate the way we're participating in this, uh, in this workshop, this seminar uh, today, for example. The other thing that we learned is that mail-in voting is safe and reliable and it increases participation by voters. So as Senator Moran said, uh, the House and the Senate both have already extended that 
uh, in the short term to encompass all of our municipal elections that will be happening in April, May, and June, I guess, of, of this uh, spring. Um, and there is a commitment from Speaker Mariano that uh, we will be looking at these reforms and um, bringing them forward to the floor for debate to uh, enshrine them permanently in, in statute uh, here, here in Massachusetts. And I think it is absolutely a, a step in the right direction. And by gosh, we're gonna have drop boxes outside. You're not gonna have to go into a town hall building to drop your ballots off there as they're proposing in, in Virginia. And if people choose to show up on election day, it's gonna be okay to hand somebody a bottle of water. We're not gonna outlaw that either. So uh, we're in good hands here in Massachusetts. There's a lot of good stuff in this bill in addition to the, the early voting. You know, this, um, uh, this ERIC Electronic Registration Information Center, uh, we already passed this in 2018. Uh, the Secretary of State hasn't yet uh, fully uh, implemented it or engaged in it, but it's, it's a way to ensure that the people who are on the voter rolls um, uh, you know, that, that that information is accurate. And lastly, with same day voter registration, we have to work some things out with our local town clerks to make sure that it's workable at the local level. There aren't insurmountable, insurmountable barriers there, but there are some questions that my clerks have raised with me. But where this is really important is for the person who contacted me four years ago now, when they went to renew their driver's license, they were said, asked, would you like to, uh, while you're changing your, they were moving from Harwich to Chatham. Would you like to change, while you're changing the address on your driver's license, would you like to change your voter registration? Sure, it seemed easy. So they said, yes, at that time we had, I can't remember what the lead time was, like months out, you had to register before, prior to when the election was held. So they changed that. They show up at Chatham polling place the day of the election and the clerk says, you're not registered here because you didn't register in, t in enough days in advance of the election. They went back to Harwich. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not registered here because you changed your voter, voter registration to Chatham. We had same day voter registration. They could have re-enrolled, filled out a preliminary ballot. After election day was over, that ballot could have been certified. The registration could have been certified and that constituent of mine would not have been disenfranchised. So this is, a very practical example of why we need to move forward with these measures. Thank you. I, I think um, in other states that have same day voter registration, most of the people doing it are actually correcting mistakes, not registering for the first time. So Representative Exaros on, vote, on the voting issue. Thank you. You know, to, to Representative Diggs and I, it's, it's, it's pretty new to us. And what I learned, uh, imagine running for office uh, in the middle of a pandemic. But what I did learn is people are excited about politics. So not only do we wanna get them to vote uh, in whatever ways we, we, we can come together on, but have, you know, for the, for the audience out there, you know, get involved. It's an exciting time to be an elected official, uh, run for office and, and serve others. And uh, it also reminds me of, of the worst uh, in a way, you know, Representative Diggs and I arrived at the State House on January 6th for the most special, one of the most special days of our lives to be sworn in at the People's House in Boston in the middle of a pandemic. We had no family, no friends, uh, but we sat together and we did it. And when we walked out, a reporter asked me at the, on the steps of the State House, how was it? And I said, oh my God, it was beautiful. You know, we we were sworn in and what a, what a great day. And then she said, well, what do you think about what's happening in Washington? And I had no idea what she was talking about. And I drove home and turned on the news at six o'clock and saw what happened. So on that same day that we celebrated becoming uh, elected officials, uh, there was chaos in Washington. And we have to do what we can to make sure that never happens again. Anyone else want to chime in a little bit on voting before we go to closing statements? I'll chime in briefly just to say that, you know, in a once in a generation pandemic that had everyone isolated and no one near each other, Massachusetts had record voter turnout. That's, that says something about the effectiveness of expanding early voting and expanding um, vote by mail. 
It's been incredibly effective. There's no way we're going back um, and we're gonna enshrine this uh, into law. The other part of this too, we've seen that people who have the mail-in ballots, they, you know, they don't, that don't go vote immediately on election day. They sit at home with their mail-in ballots and they fill out the down ballot races, the planning board, these like other committees, right? That a lot of times get blanked. Well, now they have the time to Google these people, see what their stances are, learn more about the issue. And so this improves democracy at the top of the ticket, all the way to the bottom of the ticket. Spoken like a league member. And I would, I would dearly hope that all of you encourage the legislature to get this vote bill passed this summer so that it's in effect for the municipal elections this fall and all subsequent elections so we don't have to just keep extending the one from the last fall, but we can actually get something permanent in place and, and the, it'll give the clerks a, a better sense of what they're dealing with each election too. So we have come to closing remarks and since our time is so limited today and we had so many questions to ask, we are suggesting two more issues that you might want to mention in your closing remarks, although feel free to share whatever you are most concerned about as well. The first is the Common Start legislation, which will establish a universal system of affordable, high quality, early education and child care. It's supported by both the League and the Cape Women's Association or Coalition. And Representatives Peaks, Diggs and Fernandez are co-sponsors of this bill. The second issue is transparency in state government. Um, so each of you will have uh, another two minutes in the same order that we started, uh, which is represented district, vegetable district order. So uh, Representative Whelan, you go first. Sure, uh, what I really wanted to focus on Nancy in my remarks here was on what I think is probably the most pressing issue facing um, the Cape right now. And it is COVID related um, and, and it's an adjunct to the larger picture, but we haven't discussed it at all yet. And that's um, what, what's economic recovery going to look like here on Cape Cod, particularly as we're coming into a busy summer months, because um, as we know, I mean, a lot of our businesses uh, are relying on, you know, having a, a very strong summer season going forward in order to stay alive and keep employing people. What we want to do is we want to see more and more people get on the work rolls and come off of the unemployment rolls. And we want to see our hardworking small business people and their employees um, flourish. Part of that, uh, and, I, and I get, I'm going to give credit to leadership in the House and the Senate um, for fast tracking a bill that we just passed um, uh, and, and we enacted just uh, uh, yesterday. And the, the part of the economic recovery was uh, in, in this bill, it included tax forgiveness for the uh, Paycheck Protection Loans. Um, and it also delayed the uh, onset of new fee increases for the Department of Unemployment. Speaking to uh, restaurant owners, hospitality managers, small business people in my district who benefit from these programs, it, it's critical that we got the, uh, that we got this done. We got it over the line, and the governor, I believe, is going to be signing that early next week. Um, and I see that some of the stuff that's going to be really important for us going forward in the next um, uh, the, the next couple of months, and we are all talking right now, and we're working collectively on, is doing everything that we can to support our small businesses and to make sure that they that they do have a, a, again a strong tourist season, so particularly out in the islands where I mean it's even a smaller window of opportunity, um, but certainly here on the Cape as well. So um, look. Look for a lot more news from us going forward on what our works are going to be um, to help out our employers and to uh, keep the Cape the economic engine that it's been for all these years. Uh, because as the Cape succeeds, so too does the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts with the revenue that we generate. Thank you. Thank you. And Representative Diggs. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for this. This is awesome. Um, one, one thing that we haven't really brought up is, is mental health. I think mental health is going to be, you know, trying to be proactive. I think that there's a lot of things that are going on because of it's caused so much stress. You know, are kids going back to school? Uh, are they going to be safe? Are the teachers going to be safe? All that stuff, it's causing anxiety. And, and some people know how to deal with it. Some people don't know how to deal with anxiety. But we also need to be able to help those that don't know how to deal with it so that they can deal because, you know, we need to go back to work and we need to go ahead and, you know, 
everyone's going to be coming to Cape Cod. Cape Cod's going to be the capital of Massachusetts come after school's out. So everyone's going to be coming to us, but we need to feel safe and comfortable and be able to make that money that we want to be able to make. But to be safe and comfortable, we need to make sure that every avenue, uh, our, our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted so that we're all, we're, we feel safe and we can make money. And, you know, we don't have to worry about putting the mask. To the, whatever we have to do, we have to make sure of. And I believe that the, we have to take care of the mental health. I think that's the key. So I'll end on that. Thank you. Representative Peek, your closing thoughts. Great. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for having the, the group gathered uh, here today. Uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, I was talking so much about COVID. I didn't talk about my legislative priorities uh, this time or my new fancy title. We have a new speaker of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, Ron Mariano, and he has appointed me to be the second assistant majority leader this session. So while I don't have specific uh, committee assignments, uh, I get to be a generalist, which is with my lawyering training. This is something that I, I do truly love. Um, I filed several significant in, in, uh, bills to address climate change and in the area of the environment, going back to my roots as a, as a, a young environmentalist and able to devote time uh, to that, and as Representative Fernandez pointed out, I think we here on the Cape see and feel the effects of climate change more than really any other region in Massachusetts. And certainly, you know, you could argue uh, more than any other coastal region uh, that's around. I was just reelected yesterday as the co-chair of the Regional Transit Authority Caucus, kind of putting out a fire now to ensure that transportation for our most vulnerable through the human service transportation doesn't get consolidated by the administration into such huge districts that literally somebody's gonna be left at the curb and not have their bus ride or their, uh, their cab ride to get them where they need to be. Um, on transparency, I would encourage people to go to the state website to sign up for alerts uh, for bills that they are following to look at our roll call votes that are posted there. And all committee hearings now are streamed live and those hearings are, uh, are archived. So if you can't make the hearing itself, you can go back at a time that's convenient for you and watch those hearings. Uh, we encourage people's participation and we welcome that. And again, thank you for having me. Thank you. And now Representative Exaros. Thank you, I love this. Thank you for allowing me to be part of it. Um, we touched on a lot of topics, but there's a lot more too. I wish we had more time, but I support full transparency. And as far as the bills that we're, we filed, I actually filed 23 you know, of our own and I think co-signed about 200. And some of them that are most important that come to my mind right now, they're a little bit different. Some are public safety related because I have that background. I'm very concerned with police reform. It's a big issue. We need to hold our police officers accountable, uh, but we also give, have to give them the training and the tools to be successful. I'm on a commission that will be talking about that. So please reach out if you have any concerns. Uh, but two of the bills that we filed, uh, one is the diaper bill, which might uh, you know, have your interest you know, we have women and families that have to decide whether or not to spend money on diapers for their babies or, or buy medicine. And uh, we filed a bill that will try to address that to allow families to be able to get uh, disposable diapers. And another one is the canine Nero bill. So to the animal lovers out there, that means a lot to me and my, my uh, family of police officers. K-9 Nero was a Yarmouth police canine that was shot in the line of duty. Sean Gannon, his handle was murdered. And uh, the paramedics in Massachusetts are not allowed to help an injured animal. It's against the rules. So we filed a bill to fix that. And I'd ask you to look at that. And as uh, Representative Peek said, you can follow a lot of the things online, which is fantastic. And reach out to me at my office uh, on any issues and the team will reach out back and help you. We love doing this. It's all about service and I'm proud to be part of it. Thank you. And, and now Senator Moran. 
Thank you, Nancy. And thanks again to the league. I'm very happy to have been part of this forum. And I'm particularly happy that you mentioned the Common Start legislation. There's a website called commonstartma.org, which gives a lot of specific information. But, you know, uh, um, Rep. Whalen was talking about economic recovery from COVID. And COVID has hit women particularly hard. Uh, lots of families heavily weighted towards women have actually given up jobs to stay home, help homeschool their kids, take care of uh, relatives. This is something that has absolutely thrown a monkey wrench into career development, into pay parity. This is something um, that's had really um, a lot of effect on children and what, what the family momentum has been. So it's both economic and social and mental health um, issues. And there's nothing that's going to be sort of more solved, really helpful than the universal child care bill. Um, the, the premise of the bill is that we're going to need to be starting from age zero in terms of subsidized child care. Um, it has the lowest income families subsidized at about 50%. It's going to be a five year rollout, but the care is going to continue ages five to 12 after school and for special needs kids up to age 15. The other thing it does is women um, by far make up a big piece of the uh, child care workforce. And it's gonna have a, a piece that plugs in to career development over time, which is also gonna have the effect of when you look at you know, young children intervention at very young ages, which is gonna improve our generation going forward, it's gonna really put some expertise into that area. And it's gonna help owners of childcare businesses be paid uh, the amount of the services that actually cost them. Lastly, it's gonna take the licensing authorities and it's gonna give them some data points and a boost in the work that they've done. So when you look at the, a point in time when a legislation is really needed, the point is now coming out of COVID and the legislation needed is commonstart.org. And uh, thanks, um, commonstartma.org. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so much for this forum, Nancy and the League. Thank you. And on behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Cape Cod area and our partners. Nancy, the Cape did you want me to chime in? Or, sure. uh, or we can oh, just- Oh, did I leave? It to. It's, that's what I, you know. I'm sorry. What the League wants. Never mind. I'll do anything for the league, Nancy. You know that. Please, please chime in. I'm sorry. I, I, apologies. <laughs> all good. All good. Well, um, well, I just want to applaud Sue. I mean, this is the issue of of, of child care and equitable access to child care is something uh, you know was was a huge issue pre pandemic and has just. Um, exploded um, during the pandemic and become a real problem uh, for families and a real issue of, of getting us all back to work um, and a real uh, economic security issue. Um, so I'm, I'm more than happy um, to support Sue in that effort. I was recently appointed as, as the vice chair of the Committee on Tourism, Arts and Culture, incredibly important. Um, committee for our district. My, my good friend Kip Diggs uh, sits on that committee uh, as well. And, you know, this is an industry that has been absolutely decimated, um, especially, uh, especially the, 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 the arts and the performing arts has been incredibly hard hit. And, and that entire um, part of our economy is specific to the Cape and Islands. It's really um, how we make our, our living here. So working to revitalize that uh, is going to be one of um, uh, my, my core jobs moving forward this legislative session. Um, also on uh, the committees on global warming and telecommunications, utilities, and energy, we have an opportunity in Massachusetts to be uh, to solidify ourselves as the nationwide leader in offshore wind. These are 
uh, projects going 12 miles south of the vineyard just outside of my district. Deep water offshore wind is our only path to a clean energy future, and it's going to bring uh, good paying jobs, year round jobs here to the Cape and Islands. And that's something that I'm certainly going to be supportive of filed uh, pieces of legislation on that. And I know the whole delegation is behind that as well. Thank you. And I, again, my apologies. Sometimes things happen. No worries. You know, I don't look as fancy as my fellow colleagues. I, I, uh, you know, I, I didn't wear a shirt and tie to go from my, uh, my bedroom to my living room, but I do give these guys credit for looking so good. So I guess I, like I, 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 I wish so, I had your hair. <laughs> so anyway, as I was saying before I realized that I forgot, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of the Cape and our partners, the Cape Women's Coalition and the Cape Cod Community Media Center, I do wanna thank all of you and just say how lucky the Cape is to have such a powerful, cohesive delegation to act on its, in its interests. I wish Metro West had that where I live. Um, to the audience who are watching and will be watching the repeat of this, consider contacting your leg legislatures on issues that are important to you in your community. They are your representatives and they want feedback from their constituents. They like to hear from you. By remaining active in the political process, you not only emphasize your concerns, but that's a way to extend your power beyond just voting, beyond the ballot box. So for more information on how to contact your legislators, you can visit the uh, league's web website, www.lwvcapecod.org. And thank you, and thank all of you, and, and good evening, good afternoon. Our pleasure, Nancy. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Nancy. Nancy. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Nancy. Hey, Nancy, you're on mute. Yeah, I figures. Second mistake. So all set? Would you believe? We're all good. Good to go. Thank, Thank you. you. The timing was lovely. Thank you. Thank you. You look great. The backgrounds look great. Um, I think it went quite, quite well. And, you know, leaving somebody out makes it more human. <laughs> exactly. It personalizes it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> all yeah. right. Thanks for all the help. All right. Bye-bye.